to allow uh, us to have a forum and an opportunity for us to be open and to talk and to challenge our thinking is vital and critical to our growth, but the growth of, of schools in general. I have two daughters, one's 19 years old, one's 17, my 19 year old's at Gettysburg, she wants to become a head of school. <laughs> Don't know where that came from. Uh, but she's creative and innovative and unafraid. And we could use more powerful women in our leadership structures in our institutions. And I'm really proud of what she's choosing to, to head into. My, my other daughter is a 17-year-old uh, living with her mom in Brookline, Massachusetts, and uh, is a very creative, deep thinker who has a world of ideas and concepts, but doesn't know what her future holds. So uh, it's an exciting time for all of us as we're deeply involved in education of children uh, to challenge and encourage each other and use the great ideas that others have to share here today. Um, the most important thing that we continue to think about as an institution is not focusing on what our students need to know, but on how we can develop in them a way in which they're able to actually do things. So it's a process, and we're excited to have you here, we're excited to learn from you, and excited to share our own ideas and concepts and learn from people who've done some deep thinking and some research, who can bring some ideas and concepts that can better all of us and create a wonderful pathway um, for our students. I want to first begin uh, by thanking Sean Yorgi, who heads our Innovation Center and was the driver behind this. This past year, I said to Sean, there are a couple of things that we need to accomplish. One is we need to have an event on our campus that has a bunch of other courageous, creative people in the mix, and you're going to make that happen. And that's fine in theory, but you all know, if any of you have gone through the process of trying to create a conference or some sort of event, that it's not an easy task on top of all the other things that uh, the ones required to do. Sean's done a fantastic job going from science department chair and creative thinker and tinkerer to being the driving force behind uh, our innovation center here at Perkiem, and I would love for us to just give him a roaring round of applause. There are many people in the, in the mix for sure, but uh, Sean's my partner in this. The reality is, as an institution and as educators, we know we can do better, and that's why we're here. So I'm delighted to um, welcome Ted Dintersmith. His work as an educational change agent is inspiring. His philosophies are well aligned with the work that we're doing here. Um, he's been focused on impacting education and innovation on the future of civil society. His professional background spans technology, entrepreneurship, and public policy. He was ranked by Business 2.0 as the top performing US venture capitalist, capitalist from 1995 to 1999. And in 2012, President Obama appointed him to represent our country at the United Nations General Assembly. More recently, the executive produced the acclaimed documentary, Most Likely to Succeed, and co-authored with Tony Wagner, a book with the same title. Ted's most recent book, What School Could Be, Insights and Inspiration from Teachers Across America, is based on an immersive trip he took to all 50 states during a single school year. And in 2018, he received the NEA's prestigious Friend of Education Award. Ted earned a PhD in engineering from Stanford and an undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary with high honors in physics and English. When he's not visiting schools, he lives in central Virginia. I know that during these sessions, we're going to learn a lot from him. He'll have an opportunity to pose questions. And this is a great chance for all of us who value kids, value education, and most importantly, value the world we live in to be able to be a part of this today. So I'd like to welcome you. Thank you. I feel like Mr. Rogers, I should now put on my sweater because I'm going to the next rolling. <laughs> that was my Halloween costume. My wife had me dress up as Mr. Rogers. <laughs> but I had in my closet a cardigan sweater. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> so I actually grew up with Mr. Rogers. So my father was an eighth grade teacher at St. Edmunds Academy in Pittsburgh. 
and uh, he and uh, Fred Rogers went to school together and were very close and served on uh, boards together. And so when I watched that documentary, it really brought me back home. What an amazing job that uh, that individual did. What an amazing job that individual did. <laughs> I don't like microphones. Um, in uh, stretching us and developing opportunities for kids to find themselves and to feel valued and to have a voice. So um, it's a delight to be here today. Um, Ted uh, thinks he can get the most out of this style of communication. So we're going to get a, an opportunity to hear um, a wealth of information from him through a series of, of questions I'm going to pose. And later on, we'll all have a chance to ask questions of him. Um, so you've had a successful and varied career, as we just heard. Uh, Diane, throughout your life and throughout your work as an education reform agent, do you consider yourself an optimist or a pessimist? And how do you think that influences your approach to your work? So, um, good question. You know, it's funny. I, I had a fair amount of time on a plane yesterday to think about life in general. You know, I, I think most people, if you ask them, are you an optimist or a pessimist, even if they're a pessimist, we'll say they're an optimist. I actually am I'm a, more of a pessimist by nature. And so I'm just going to fess up. I mean, I am more of a pessimist. And, you know, it helped me in venture capital because you had to be paranoid. You know, if you didn't see the many things that could go wrong, you weren't going to do the things that were imperative to do right. And so, uh, you know, I, I see lots of things that give me reasons for optimism. But, you know, I started on this stuff, you know, I, I shared the story that when I really got focused on the issues around, I call it the collision between a world of innovation and an education world largely rooted in uh, the, the distant past, you know, I would say to people that if schools don't change profoundly, I'm not convinced our democracy will hold together. That was like eight, nine, ten years ago, and, you know, People generally view me the way they view somebody on a street corner with the, like the scraggly beard and the end of day sign. I mean, it was really true. I mean, I, I, I was sort of was phasing out of venture capital, and people I know were saying, and they'd share it with my wife, that retirement isn't agreeing well with Ted. You know, and he's kind of lost it. You know, but I, you know, look around us today. I mean, you know, like democracy is fragile. Right? We have no assurance that the society will hold together. and. Today, I think it's far more plausible to look at what's going on and say we should be worried. We should be deeply, deeply troubled by a lot of what we see. And so, so at the end of the day, you know, do, do you believe that the root cause is education? I do. Do you believe that we can do much better work? And, and do we have people doing great work? We do. So there are those pockets that give me a lot of optimism. But I worry every single night, will we make those changes? in a timely enough way that we don't have the kind of a crisis that I do think we're going through a crisis right now when too many people can't fact check, too many people are pissed off and just alienated. And you start to see crazy things happen in a society where, you know, it just gives me chills. Yeah, so, um, so on this long journey that you spent for an entire year, um, you had an opportunity to see a, a you know, variety of schools some with resources, some without, some in uh, locations in the middle of nowhere, some in the center city. What were some of the more extreme forms of education? What are some of the memorable things that you saw out there uh, during your journey? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the best answer is read the book. <laughs> so, that's, those were the memorable things. Um, you know, a couple of things blew me away. I mean, I didn't really have any intent when I took that trip about writing a book. That was not, it wasn't like, I want to write a book, so let's take a trip. It was, I just told you how concerned I am. It was, let's get out there and sort of meet with people and express. You know, I, I feel like I've got this obligation because I do have a great, uh, a lot of time spent in the world of innovation and, and know something about it. And so understanding sort of the tsunami of change headed in our way, that, that I think a lot of people will nod their head and say, oh yeah, I see that, that's gonna happen. None of us see it. We, we, it's beyond our ability to imagine. I mean, it's going to shift and change every nook and cranny of the world we live in and certainly completely define the world of our kids. And so 
So I said, I'm going to take a trip because I want to get that word out. And maybe I'll pick up some things along the way. And that was basically the idea. And then I went from a trip to maybe a bigger trip to somehow I had this idea of going to 50 states. And you know, that seemed like a cool thing to do. That's how much thought went into it. <laughs> I wish I could say I was a careful planner. But it was like, on a plane trip, I said, what the heck, I'm going to go to all 50 states. Um, you know, but first and foremost, you know, I didn't go in really having much of a bias or sense of what I learned from the people I met. And, and if, I, if I had a headline, and it's in the subtitle of my book, it was how blown away I was by the dedication, the commitment, the tenacity of our teachers. I mean, that they, you know, like when you work in the world of entrepreneurs and startups, you think you're dealing with the most dedicated, committed people, people who work 90 hours a week and not complain. But they, they do that, they do that because they want to change the world, but they also do that because they get stock options. I haven't met a teacher in the country to get stock options, <laughs> but they have that same commitment and dedication. And so that was like the best and the most inspiring the thing that just kept me going. But then I met with a lot of legislators. And, and you know, for every point of inspiration from teachers, there's a point of desperation from legislators. And, you know, and, you know I have nothing to lose, right? I, I don't have to worry about hurting anybody's feelings, but I meet with these legislators and I just go right at them and say, I know your goal isn't to impair the future of your kids and to drive the best teachers out of the profession, but that's what you're doing. And um, you know, so it was that, and then in the book, I mean, we can get into that, but I just was blown away by things that on the surface look really different, but tried to get at the underlying principles. But the other common denominator, a couple things relevant to this group is one, every single thing I write about, when you ask the teacher or the principal, or in some cases a superintendent, but generally teachers and principals, like, where did the idea come from? It wasn't that somebody told me to do it, it wasn't in the manual or the email edict that I got, it wasn't that somebody else did it and I copied exactly that. It was their idea, it was something they passionately believed was important. But every single time they said somebody had their back. You know, if it was a teacher, the principal was supporting them. You know, so you just talked about the great relationship you have. I mean, you know, I spent some time this morning, John's doing remarkable work here, but you've got his back, you're, you're in it with him. And when you start to realize that we trust teachers and the people that occupy the higher ends of the education pyramid, often quite irresponsibly, shifting gears and said we're going to trust and respect teachers and treat them like professionals, all sorts of amazing things happen. And so that's what I really wrote about. That's what moved me as I traveled. So um, obviously there's so many layers to the obstacles that get in the way of education and reform. What do you see as the, the biggest challenges for us in trying to move move forward? And I know that's such a broad question, and it's different for independent schools than it is public schools. It is uh, for schools that aren't well funded versus ones that are, you know, trying to survive. But what do you see as the some of the biggest challenges? Well, I mean, there's a reason we call it a, an education system, right? Systems, by definition, have multiple interlocking parts. And once they're placed and ingrained, each of those parts tends to want to gravitate back to the system, right? And so, so what are the things that matter? In public schools, they have to deal with these state regulations, which are onerous. I mean, you know, I always invite people to go look at some of the sample questions of the state-mandated tests. I mean, it's the bottom of the education barrel, um, so they have to deal with that. But there are a whole bunch of things. I mean, you know, for a school, every school, but you know, the college admissions is deeply broken. And they need to understand that. I do my best to help them understand that. But I, I say, I've given keynotes the last three years to a bunch of college admissions officers. I say, if you change your admissions policies, K through 12 would change overnight. You know, but they sort of say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. We're flooding with applications. We sort of had this going. Why do we want to change? And they're slow. They're not very innovative. Parents, you know, parents are incredibly determined for their kid to succeed. I'm a parent, I understand that. But they're also risk averse. And they're also, as I view myself, and I still view myself as a work in process in terms of understanding education. It's a very complex, nuanced, fascinating field. So I do not, in any sense, regard myself as an education expert. But, but I work hard to try to understand. But you, you deal with them, right? I mean, every parent is an education expert because they went to school, right? They know what's best. They, you, know, you often get these things from parents where they say, my kid's having fun, they can't be learning. <laughs> and and you, know, you start to think when you introduce something that 
could be way better for the child, but potentially could jeopardize their chance to get into the dream college of the parents, they get nervous, right? And so you get those things, and you, you know, just get a whole bunch of these things, and so how do you break out of it? And, you know, it, it will happen, right? You know, and it's, it is happening. So the phrase I use is change happens slowly, right up until it happens quickly. So as I travel, you ask about optimism versus pessimism, I see so many great things happening that is there. I mean, it's not that we have to invent it, it's not that we don't know what to do, and there's nothing about my films or my book. I think that when somebody who's an expert in educate, when a classroom teacher reads it, I don't expect, and it doesn't happen, they don't read it and say, oh my gosh, I never thought of that. I mean, it means I'm saying things they know, that they, they are the experts on it, and I, I don't by any means expect that they're gonna read this and say, I would have never thought of that. I, I think what, the feedback I get is what they find interesting is thank God a business person says this. <laughs> like, like, like finally a business person's out there saying we ought to trust teachers. You know, you know, finally somebody that's a neutral party says these state mandated tests and the SAT and ACT and AP scores should be just flushed out the toilet. And, and we all know if that happened, education would be dramatically better. But these are the leverage points, and I think we all need to work hard on getting some of those things to change. It's interesting that you, you were talking about the back how necessary and essential that is for anyone that's putting themselves out there, that without having that backing, the, the risks are significant. Can, can I just ask, how many of you in the room um, are involved with independent schools? Public schools? Not in either type, but in another realm? Great. So, um, so in each of our positions, um, I'm just reminded of how unbelievably challenging it is, and it becomes more challenging when you have children. So if you're young and you're ready to take risks, that's one stage of life. But if you have kids, then all of a sudden there's another layer to it that makes it complicated. And being a, a headmaster of a school, uh, I may have what I think is a great idea or concept, but I have a board, then I have the parent body, then I have a variety of layers of history in trying to move forward with something that are frightening because I could lose my job in a heartbeat if people are not confident that their kids are getting what they're paying for. So I always go back to colleges and say to myself, oh, if they would just make some shifts in, in their structure and their system, that would allow us the room and latitude to make changes. But without colleges doing that, I'm not sure when that's going to happen to the level it could at, at our level at high school. Yeah, and, and in my book, I cover some innovative colleges, um, and there are some, um, but not many. And um, But I think we're going to see a wave of alternatives to that. And the, 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 the model for college is just so broken. Um, you know, I relate to my own experience. So I, I, the oldest person in the room. Um, but I, I graduated from a public college in Virginia, and people are always stunned when I relate. My senior year, the entire year's tuition for everything, the entire year's tuition at College of William and Mary was 250 bucks. And, and I was able, my mom worked part time, but I covered most of that cost for the summer job. You know, 250 bucks, right? That, that's, you know, that's kind of a stunning number. And, and these colleges have baked in cost structures. You know, like one of the things, one of, there are these ideas floating around that, that sound good on paper, but are actually profoundly bad ideas. And so when you hear somebody say, we need to make all college free, that's a profoundly bad idea. You know, you know first they don't mean all colleges, they mean public colleges, because they can't control private colleges. Free, they don't mean free, they mean no tuition. Uh, they're not gonna put any more dollars to help those colleges be better. You know, and so those colleges are already struggling for money. They're going to then have to do more big lecture hall courses and all. You know, it's like it's like not the direction. You know, we need to make college better and more affordable, and we need to get away from everybody has to do certain amounts of seat time and distribution requirements. It's been four years. We need to get away from you know. You know, we, we were chatting before about the, the the really transformational impact of a gap year on kids. Yet when I talk to parents, particularly rich parents, the idea of a gap year makes them really nervous. Oh, my kid will learn, lose momentum. They might actually not want to keep doing this stuff, which I think could be an interesting thing. Um, 
But, but if a method written might say, Ted, you got it all wrong. Every kid takes a gap year. It's just for most of them, it's freshman year of college. <laughs> and, and you know, and it is, right? And, and you know, and so this, this happens. But the, the, the model of college, and this is the issue I have, is that it's the, the rule of fives, OK? So of every 100 kids in our eighth grade classes today, you know, out of the 100, 20 don't finish high school. They're in a world of hurt. 20 graduate from high school, but no more. In America today, with just a high school degree, the way we constructed K through 12 education, they have no doors open for them. Like they are screwed over. 20 start down the path of four-year college, but drop out. So you're a dropout, generally from an anonymous college, often with student loan debt. You're in trouble. 20 graduate from college, often with a lot of student loan debt, but end up working in a Starbucks type job. And they live with and deal with the overhang of that student loan debt for decades. That life has not been elevated. So out of 120 graduate from college and get the kind of job we think a college degree leads to, and even those, many of them are, are struggling with student loan debt. And so when people say we just need to get more kids into college and everything will be well, I push back and say we need to make K-12 mean something. And if kids can learn really interesting things they care about in K-12, and open doors for themselves through that experience, and college admissions officers came to their senses and started to value that, we would be dramatically better off. And I think there's far more likelihood to see change in K-12, maybe change in admissions. I think there's some encouraging things happening, happening there. And these alternatives to four years of very expensive college education and more short-term emergence, where kids can dip in and dip out and take three months here and then work for two or three years and come back and come back. I think that's going to be the world our kindergarten kids will live in going forward. So um, the conversation about moving education away from the industrialized model built for the Industrial Revolution is not new. Why is now the critical moment when change is needed? You know, the, the, the challenge I've had, I've a lot of schools, that I, and I challenge them, I say, I, I'm willing to make this bet. If a kid in your school, if a student is excellent at memorizing content, performing low-level procedures error-free quickly, and following instructions, I will bet a lot that that kid's on your honor roll. And, and that's true, right? That's true in K-12, it's true in most colleges. Memorize material, perform low-level procedures, follow instructions. It's exactly what machine intelligence does. And, and at the same time, we're making kids be really good at something that already machine intelligence excels at. We are crushing out of them all sorts of things that are important. And, and I'll, I'll relate a couple, right? So, so in most high schools I go to when I observe classes, about the only question kids ask is, will this be on the test? When I talk to college professors and say, how often does a kid come to see you in office hours because they're curious about the, the topic? They say, if that happens once a month, I'm ecstatic. They come to bicker about a grade or to find out what's going to be on the test or to find out what they should be studying. That's what we're doing to these kids. I, I have this anecdote in my book um, where, where, so I spent a lot of time in North Dakota. You could ask me why, but, but I work closely with them at all levels to, to demonstrate that it is possible to change all schools at the state level. And they're making a lot of progress. But teacher in Fargo, this is a lot, a lot of people in this room will relate to it, say they've done it themselves, they know the power of it. But second grade teacher in Fargo does one day a week a free exploration time for her kids. She calls it genius time. And the thing she does that I think is really important is she is on the ultimate form of accountability. So kids can work on whatever they want to work on, but they have to be able to, in that process, teach their classmates what they've been learning. And as you know, no, you never learn anything as well as when you have to teach somebody else. And so it's not just play a video game or do just dive in to do something and goof off. I'm going to learn something intentionally but share what I've learned with my classmates. Right? So I'm in a different part of the state, Mina, which is in the northwest part of North Dakota. And I meet with a group of, of educators there. There's a high school teacher who heard about what Kayla Delzer is doing in Fargo and said, this would be great. I'm going to try it with my kids. So these are juniors taking English in a high school in Minot, goes into the class one day and says, great news, for the rest of the school year, one day a week, you guys can work on whatever you're interested in. 
correlated that half the kids did a Google search, what should I be interested in? <laughs> and you know, it's like, it's, it's, your reaction's the same. Whenever I share that story, your reaction's like everybody. There's a laughter, but then it settles in. And you realize, what, what are we doing to these kids if you have to Google what you're interested in? I mean, like, why? And, but the kids are responding to the conditions we place on them. If, if the parents of the school, if everybody's saying, organize your entire life to have a slightly better college application, that they pay attention to the values we oppose. They pay attention to what we reward. That is going to matter. If we're not saying to them, create bold initiatives that in a way you can explain make your world better, but instead we're saying, pick extracurriculars, do projects, take courses that are going to look better to some anonymous 28-year-old college admissions officer, and hope that the 15 seconds they spend on your application goes better than it might otherwise. That shapes their values. And I would say, you can, if you do that to a kid for 12 to 16 years, don't count on a graduation speech to instill a sense of purpose in them. You know, the best graduation speaker in the world saying, go out and make the world better. But for 12 to 16 years, you've said, I'll compete your classmates and do a bunch of stuff you don't believe is important, just to look slightly better than some third party you'll never leave. That's the kids we're going to be producing. And we do, I think, way too much of that in our schools. <laughs> but you know, but you can do that. You know, it's like these are these are interesting things. You know, like when I what I write about, what I get excited about, is I'll go and, and you you guys know this. You you can tell so much from a school just walking around. You know, you can see the feel of it. You can watch these kids who are bouncing along and do they look really happy to be there. And, when you go look at the classrooms, you know, like the places that really are doing amazing work. When I look at the classrooms, I have to spend some time trying to find out where the teacher is. They're off huddle with people, you know, like they, and you interview these kids, and the kids are, are not just excited about their school, but when you ask them what they're working on and what they're learning, they're quite precise about it. But they really do understand. They are like, I'm working on this, and they're really great reasons. And the reasons are always, I'm intellectually curious about this, so I'm learning more and I'm reading this. Or I decided to do something, write a short story, or you know, work with some classmates to create a play, or do a nonprofit. You know, like, but these things, and so I want to do this. It matters to me. I had a big say in what I want to do. And therefore, what you see me doing here in the school is all organized. It'll be accomplished something I think is important. If that's the feel we have in schools across America, we're going to unleash the, these kids are great kids. I mean, these kids want to make their world better. You know, I'm a big believer in these kids, and I'm a big believer in teachers. But, you know, if in fact we said we're going to value schools for doing exactly what I said, helping kids find their own distinctive way to create, invent, and implement an initiative that makes the world better. And over the course of the years, have a growing body of work and evidence that that's what they've in fact gotten really good at. Boy, they're off to the races, and it can be done. So I, I want to highlight this is one of my favorite examples in the book. So, so you know, I went, nine months go all over the country every day. I promise, every day was like 7:30 in the morning till 10:30 at night. I think that's why the book, to the extent you read it, you think it's good. That's why, is I had this wealth of things that I saw, and so I was able to pick incredible things, not from a few examples, but from nine straight months, every single school day, 7.30 in the morning till 10.30 at night, lots of people lost to work. I spent a day, you know, and I had a team planning this for me, so I, I cheated a little bit, but, um, so I was in Maryland, and they said, well, we've been able to arrange, you're gonna spend a day, and when they said where I'm gonna go, I thought, I'm curious, this will be interesting, but I, shame on me, said this will be quite traditional, so I don't have high expectations for what I'll see. And that was, I deeply regret having that attitude, but I spent a day at the Naval Academy. I mean, you know, like, the United States Naval Academy, I just think this is going to be the most traditional of all places. Shame on me, I end up writing it's the most innovative education institution in the country. And, and why do I say that? It started with, and Rear Admiral Ted Carter, head of the Naval, still is, said, we started, we felt our admissions policies were deeply flawed and misleading us. He said, we used to value grade point average, SATs, Eagle Scout, letters from senators or congressmen. Those were the metrics, those were the criteria we focused on. 
And so we, we still look at that. We want to make sure there aren't any issues around that. What do we value? We value evidence that the applicant is the kind of person that just won't take no for an answer in making the world better through an initiative they played a big role in creating and carrying out. When I say that, ask yourself, is that what I'd love to see from a family member, from a neighbor, from my kids? The kind of person that just goes at something they know is important to make their world better and just whatever it takes will get that job done. Of course, I mean, like, of course that's what we want. So what did they then say? They said diversity went way up, right? Number of women, way up. They bragged about the fact that the preceding summer's boot camp, which is 12 weeks of torture, now one woman dropped out. But the other thing they did, which I think is really important, is they rethought the way that Naval Academy experience was. And so the first thing they did is they shut down all of the bullshit intro courses that pervade our college campuses. And so instead of having big lecture halls with people taking notes, it's Socratic seminars, project-based learning, it's the kind of things we all walk around and say, bingo, this is it. And they said, and they're right, is that there's so much bad pedagogy in high school to prepare kids for bad pedagogy in college. And the reason it's so telling and interesting, right, is that most colleges, when the kid graduates, they hope they get a job, mostly because they want that kid to keep donating back to the college, right? I mean, you know, they're off and running, so good luck, but please keep us in mind in your will. The Naval Academy, their graduates are the Navy. These are the next generation. They, they own and are <coughs> betting the future of their institution on the quality of the kids they produce out of the Naval Academy. That is their most important next generation of leadership. So they are in a very real way eating their own cooking. And so you look at that, you just say, my gosh. And so when I, you know, two of the last three summers, I'd give the keynotes to college admissions officers, and I'd say, if the Naval Academy is doing this, you can do this. You know, like, like don't tell me you, know, you can't spare two more minutes to evaluate real work from a kid, because you're short-staffed. You know, like, stop mailing out all the brochures to make more people apply, so you can turn them down to look more selective, and put the time in. And then I really, I'm going to do, I really, one other thing to I say, I say in, in, you talked about it. I mean, I did just fine in venture capital. The reason I did just fine in venture capital is fairly early, I grew deeply skeptical about kids with impeccable academic credentials. I, I lived in a world where most of the people who wanted to get jobs through me, who wanted to meet with me, who wanted me to back them, had an amazing undergraduate and grad, you know, Princeton and Harvard Business School. And what I figured out well, I'm not that smart, but everyone's like, figure out something that's useful. That, that those kids were so poorly prepared for a world of innovation. I call them the go fetch a dog biscuit kids. You know, they wanted to desperately to succeed. They were motivated, they were competitive. But something ambiguous, something that was inevitably going you know, to lead to lots of misfires and setbacks and failures, was something they were very uncomfortable with. They wanted just to be led through. Here's what you've got to do. So, what did I do? I, I started asking, and this served me so well, I would just say, if somebody wanted to meet with me, I would say, send me three writing samples that will tell me what you think I should know about you. If they asked for more, particularly if they asked for lots more, I said, I'm not meeting with you, right? Three writing samples that will tell me what you think I should know about you. And, and so with these admissions officers, I don't know if I share this with admissions officers, I'd say, don't tell me this is time consuming. Because I did it for a career. Look at how it worked for me. You know, like I didn't look at SATs or grade point average and academic pedigree. I wanted three tangible pieces of evidence that this person had proved themselves when they tell me what. And you know, you could, you guys know, you like if the writing's bad, I'm done with it in a minute. If their three best things aren't very good, I know all they need to know. If their three best things are quite good, I might spend. 15 minutes, an hour reading them, but I'm learning. I mean, it's fun. It's interesting to me. And when they were good, I'd follow up. I'd just have a phone call or a meeting. I'd say, you know, those three were really interesting. Could we talk a little bit about the second one? And if they were really hazy about it or sort of faded into the distant past, you know, I'd sort of, okay. But if they were really like, yeah, 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 and it could be a philosophy essay. It could be any, I mean, one of my best hires with this, she's now, she's on the cover of Forbes magazine. And she is one of the top rated venture capitalists in the country, you know, in an industry that has very few women. And she did a podcast with this guy, I can't get on it, but she could, Tim Ferriss, I don't know if any of you follow, one of the most popular podcasts. 
But before we're sending me, she talks in that podcast about her interview with me when I hired her. And she said it was the only interview she ever had that was like this because I didn't talk to her about business. I talked to her about what she was interested in. You know, I'd ask her for the right exam. And you just can learn so much from people's best work. And if, if colleges would look for tangible examples of great work and high schools were encouraging kids to do things they were incredibly proud of, that they could then share that way, I think we're off to the races. <laughs> and and it, the good news is it's starting to happen. You know, I mean, I'm like Mr. Urgency. I want it to happen like everything tomorrow morning. But, but I think we're starting to see that. So it's interesting you're, you're mentioning this. So my young, youngest daughter, um, I, I grew up in independent school. My father was my headmaster. So I had an incredible life experience. I couldn't have had a better childhood. So I wanted to replicate that for my daughters. So I knew if I at least was in education, they'd be able to go to my school. This was what my goal was in life early on. So my first daughter embraced school in the way that we would hope and had great experiences and has flourished. My second daughter uh, struggled. And it's interesting when, when we talk about the different types of schools and the environments that we create. The same environment that my one daughter thrived in, my other daughter didn't. And my one daughter's college essay revolved around her life and education experience. Some of it tied into me. So did my second. My second daughter's was Thank God I don't have to do that anymore. I'm in public school. This public school allowed me to find myself. I didn't have to wash dishes in the kitchen and do community service on top of playing a sport, on top of homework, on top of all these other things where I didn't have time to, root, to breathe or think. And that allowed her to actually grow and develop and find herself in a, in a different environment. So I think it's interesting how we look at what we're trying to create. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And so the more open we are with our thinking and with the opportunities we're providing kids, the more chances we're giving a range of kids with different learning challenges, strengths, issues. Will you speak about that? Because there's not one solution to any of this. It's about creating a variety of opportunities and ways for kids to succeed. Yeah. You know, I'm enthusiastic but not fanatic about project-based learning. You know, so people people think that I think that that's the only thing kids should do in school, and, and I don't believe that. Um, and, and I've seen some really bad project-based learning, just as it seems really bad at tech. So, so, you know, everything comes with nuance, okay? But the thing I like about complicated, ambiguous challenges, you know, and projects are a good example, is it gives kids multiple ways to show their strengths. And so, you know, I, I share this example, as I said, I spent a lot of time in North Dakota, but I, they, an eighth grade class there, we, we put up a challenge grant for, for kids across all the schools in North Dakota to identify something in their community that they think is an important issue or problem or challenge or opportunity, propose a solution, figure out how to raise money to do it, and then do it and tell us what you did. And so the group that got the award, the, the seemed like the most compelling, and it was, was an eighth grade class, Simile Middle School in Bismarck. It was kid driven, you know, where the kids said, you know, Bismarck is, you know, because it's cold here, from Bismarck, North Dakota. And these kids got onto the issue of homeless people, by and large, a lot of them have phones, but they have no way to charge them. And, you know, it wasn't a problem I would, I mean, I wouldn't have thought of that as a problem, but these kids thought it was an interesting problem. And, and so they did the research and they, they had to go through a whole set of things that included designing a solar powered charging station, but also finding out where in Bismarck to locate it. And when they thought about where to locate it, they also had to work with neighbors of that area. They found a park that they thought would be a good location, but they then had to go to neighbors to say, we are thinking about doing this. We wanted to get your input so you're not blindsided. And what was so interesting is this one kid who I'm now an email buddy with, who had generally been viewed as kind of the not very good, not very smart, not a good student, you know, kind of a, a, on that fringe element, turned out to be just an incredibly outgoing kid. And so they asked Riley, they said, Riley, could you go talk to these adults in these houses, you know, the neighboring houses, and see if you can convince them that this is a good idea, which he did. And you know, like, like suddenly Riley is on fire, 
You know, like Riley has found something he's really good at that's gained the respect of his class, not a good athlete, not a good, by traditional measure, student, but found his lane, found something that he's really good at, it, that sort of has earned him respect and support from his community. And it's like, that's a narrow definition, but the more we broaden the playing field to let kids find their own distinctive path forward, instead of having them all do test prep for some one very narrow measure of, I think, quite low level competencies, the better. And so, so that I think is, and it's really around, any one of the lines of my book I say is that, that naively I used to think the goal of, of school was to develop human potential. But I think the way our policies have played out is the goal is to rank potential. And, and so it's all about, and to rank it, you need to standardize it. To so standardize it, you've got to take all the voice of the student and teacher out of it. So, but when it's standardized, you can then compare a kid here to a kid in Topeka, Kansas, whatever. And, and, and the line I use is when standardization comes in the front door of the school, joyful learning scoots out the back. Um, you know, and, and I think that's all fair. But, but I also think, I want, to, I want to make sure I'm giving full justice, because I'm not enthusiastic about college admissions, but it's nuanced. It's, it's, it's not what a lot of parents think. And, and what I often hear, and I think this is important you know, for parents here, I write about it in the book, is that for every kid that, you know, a lot of parents think, okay, they want perfect everything. So I'm gonna wage holy war on my kid for their 12 years of K through 12 to create the perfect kid. And then they report back, we did everything right, but we didn't get into our top choice colleges. And they always use, by the way, the pronoun is telling. They always do use the we. We did everything right. And one of the questions I always ask is, how many of the colleges wanted to take both of you? And you applied to them well, none. I thought, you just need to find a college that wants you guys as a team. <laughs> but you know, like college admissions are, you know, it's, it's a crapshoot, right? You know, like, and college admissions officers particularly experienced, capable college admissions officers, they're very good at telling a manufactured kid from a real kid. And so the question, and I always ask parents to think about this, if you can find your kid in submission to do everything you think that college admissions officer wants to see, you're gonna have a very unhealthy relationship with your child, and you may produce a kid that on paper looks good that doesn't get into any of those top choice colleges and feels, feels like they've really failed. You know, I, I did this film most, I, this is weird probably, because I just saw the, the superintendent last night in Chicago, but it wasn't in Chicago either. But I did this film most likely to succeed, and we turned down Netflix to do community screening. So the very first community screening, I did, you, you need, this is the kind of stuff they have. We did our first community screening at a high school in Palo Alto, California, right next to Stanford. And they begged me to come do it. And, you know, we weren't even ready to do community screenings, but they begged me to do it. So I said, great, I'll do it. And, uh, and trying to figure out how many people would be there. And they said, well, we've got a big auditorium. So kind of high school. I said, how big is your auditorium? And they said, it holds 850. And you know, like, do you have a small room? You know, like, don't nobody's heard of. They said, no, I think we'll get a good crowd. And as we got closer to the event, it went from, it's almost committed, it's committed to, we're streaming it now into the gym. So they had to work with us technically to screen into the gym. So we did this community screening, and they were, that's what happened. They had 1,500 people come to a community screening most likely to succeed in April of 2015 at Gunn High School. Why? You may have read about them. That was the year they had five student suicides. Five in one school year. When did the suicides take place? When SATs came back, when early decision letters came back, when final acceptance letters came back. They had to have put multiple guards, the school is right by Caltrain, multiple guards at the crossing paths of the train. These were all, I mean, people said these are great kids. We had no idea. But these were kids that year in and year out had dealt with the pressure from, largely from their own parents of you've got to do this because you've got to get into school X because if you don't get into school X, you sure as heck don't want to go to school Y because school X is a path to a great life, and school Y, it's kind of, they don't say it quite this bluntly, but it's over. And these kids don't get into school X, right? School X is really hard. The, the admissions officer said, I don't see a real kid here. I say a kid pushed by parents to do everything right. And those kids just feel like failure. So I say, like, if college admissions is a crapshoot, for every admissions officer that might want perfect numbers, which there's some, 
There's another admissions officer that says, I see through this, I'm looking for a real kid. Which kid's going to be happy? Which parent-child relationship is going to be better? And if your kid gets better and better and better over a series of time and creating and caring for great initiatives, that kid's going to do just fine in life. Whether they go to the dream school of the parent, by and large, not the kid's dream school, but the parent's dream school, or some other school that, by the way, all the data says that what really matters is not how hard the school was to get into, but how organized and focused the kid was on getting something out of that experience. That stuff all fades away. So I, I think there's really a message there for parents and for schools as well to, to say, there's a better way, there's a, there's a healthier way. And if college admissions isn't as fully embracing and looking at digital portfolios, that will eventually catch up, I think, so. So it's interesting. I always, um, I've always felt that in the institutions I've worked in, um, my goal was to um, appease the parents with um, things that make them feel comfortable. So I've got coat and tie on. So the people that are coming to independent school, they're gonna need to feel and look and see some of the things that make them feel comfortable. And that on the exterior, the types of things that they're seeing within our school are what their expectations are. But behind the scenes, we're doing a whole different thing that's better than anything that they could have hoped for. But they're not gonna know that. Because there's a, there's a process that you have to go through in order to, to make this work and to function and to make it in the, you know, in the educational uh, world. And then in turn, what we're trying to do with the parents on the college front is, uh, and our director of college counseling, college counselor right over there, um, you know, we have parents come in with very high expectations. Some of them are sitting in the room of which college their child's gonna go to. And that by the time the kids graduate and are applying to schools, the set of schools that they were initially thinking of has changed. And through the, the excellence of our college counseling office and the people that are helping these kids find their pathway can broaden the set of options the parents see. So when the kids land somewhere, they're landing a spot that is the better option and not necessarily that main school that their parents were thinking going in. And I think that's one of our strengths of, of our, our office is to better educate parents. But the parent piece is so critical in this whole mix of making this work because if they're not on board with what you're trying to accomplish, this whole thing you know, crumbles. Yeah, you know, it, it's a thought experiment. It will never happen. But imagine if no kid could start four-year college before they were 21 years old. Think of what would happen, right? I mean, high schools would really want to have kids come out of high school with something interesting and fulfilling to do for those three years. And kids, when they went to college, would have a much clearer idea what they wanted to get out of it. And, and they're like, would, would these kids' futures be dramatically jeopardized by spending a fair amount of time in the real world and getting good at something? I know, like, um, you know, but, but I think I said before, you know, like, you, you talk to a lot of parents about even a gap year, and they just get so nervous that their kid will get out of the routine or lose their momentum or whatever. And so, you know, these kids are kids, right? You know, I, I think it's important for them to sort of get a sense of what they want to be, what they want to do. So we spoke about your son early in your own life experience as a dad. How were you able to come to terms with what is traditional or what the worldview might be of what people's expectations are of your child going to high school and going to college? How did you manage and respond to that challenge as a father? Well, there, there's sort of like multiple fathers here. So, so I'd say when they were young, I was, I think, pretty, pretty reflective, pretty typical of those parents. You know, like I really cared about grades and homework. And were they buckling down? I can think of all these things. They're totally embarrassing, of things that I, I did or didn't do because I was so worried that if my kid missed a day of school, they'd be set back forever. You know, I'd be like, I, I'm just a parent, right? And, and fortunately, you know, like, I think fortunately for at least my relationship with my kids is by the time they got to high school, I was at least a little bit you know, shifted in my view. And, and one of the things I did, which I think served me and them well, is by the time they got to high school, kind of my commitment to them was I wasn't going to look, I wasn't ever going to look at their report cards. Their report cards were between them and their school, and if they wanted to tell me anything about it, great. But I really, it was what they, wanted to do with that that mattered and I wasn't even going to look at it. And I did. And you know, 
my son, he, to it, he didn't tiptoe around, right? He just said, okay, good. And he had a very simple algorithm. I'm going to do the least work I have to do to get a B. So he's got this high school transcript that is one uninterrupted sequence of Bs. That's all he did. And you know, and if I had waged holy, you know, if I just gone all out and said, no, 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 you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, he would have had 95% Bs and a couple of A's. That's all the difference. It wouldn't have made any difference. And uh, you know, I didn't, you know, he sort of ended up not, he's just not terribly interested in academics. And you know, Chuck College pretty quickly and, and did something he was really excited about. And you know, he's not a, he, he likes what he's doing, and I'm excited about it. And, and then my daughter, just as you say, all kids are different, right? You know, sort of oftentimes, for those, you know, most of you probably can relate to this, but you say like, do these kids have the same genes? <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, and I got a daughter who's just very curious about stuff, and so. She never did it for the grades, but she kind of found it interesting. And so, and again, you know, it's like to me, it's more figuring out who the kid is and supporting them instead of deciding who you want the kid to be and pounding that, you know, them into a certain mold or pattern or whatever. And so, you know, and, and you know, and it, I, I often laugh. I mean, we put so much pressure on kids to somehow, if at age 17 you haven't figured out what you want to do, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a. And I read that, right, is we ask kids all the time at 17 what career they want to have, yet we all know whatever the career you can say today is, it will be gone in 10 years. Like, why does it make, you know, why does it make sense to be pushing that? And I, I share this story about myself, but I, I, was, I spent a lot of time in school, right? you know, like early 21, so I was very remedial. Um, but you know, when I was 28 years old, if you'd asked me what a business is, I couldn't have told you. I did not know anything about what a business was. And I ended up joining one, and I ended up liking it. And, and you know, the fact that I got started late, you know, that I didn't major in accounting, or something like that, would probably ruin me for it. Um, you know, it's just it's like, you know, they, like, why do we feel kids have to have figured it all out in high school, particularly when we know that their world, when they're 10 years, 20 years out, is gonna be so totally different from what it is today. So it's really a question of, if you don't know where the target is, if you don't, if all the stuff in the future is quite hazy and blurry, well, what's the best set of skills, the best competencies, the best mindsets that a kid can have when they're going into that? And it's not being really good at following a fixed path. It's being comfortable with ambiguity. It's being able to invent, create their own path forward, and then reinvent and recreate and pivot, and make all sorts of changes that you know that I think will benefit, will really help those kids going forward. So if we sort of step back and say, when there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future world will, will look like, we want to prepare kids to deal with uncertainty. And so, you know, I often find that, you know, I'm sure you get this pushback where, you know, particularly parents will, you know, like, wail on the fact of, like, I hate this course, you're not making it clear what my kid has to do to get an A. You know, like, that, that's probably in some ways hurting that kid's long-term prospects. When, when it's absolutely clear you're erasing the ambiguity that often can lead to the best of all learning experiences. And so I get this pushback. We got this great resource called the Innovation Playlist. So by one one bank for this audience, you know, www.innovationplaylist.org. I'm doing a lot with Ken Robinson on it. We've got these small steps that lead to big change resources. And so and maybe we'll get to it, but, I, but I've come to believe the single biggest challenge in US education is how do you change an existing school? So I've been working on this for the last three years of my life, doing a lot of piloting in Hawaii and North Dakota, getting the real conviction that, that it can be done and that there's a way to respect and value for leadership of future. That said, you know, that some of these things are a bit ambiguous. And, I, and sometimes teachers will say, Ted, you need, to, you need to have the minute by minute scaffolding here so we know what to do. And I'm like, I hear what you're saying, but I think it would ruin the experience if I try to, you know, like, we, we want to get away from the minute-by-minute minute scripting. And, and that's not to say all teachers, that's some, you know, few teachers, but I mean, it's like, if the world of our, and we've done it to our teachers, you know, when you think about no child left. I was in, I have to tell you, so last night I was in Chicago, and I, I did two talks in Chicago yesterday, and I know some of these people in the audience were friends with Arnie Duncan, but I said, you know, like, Arnie Duncan had the chance of a lifetime, and 
blew it. He blew it entirely, right? I mean, he had a chance to really change our thinking and our narrative about education. And instead, he took one of the biggest failures in education, no child left behind, and said, if bad isn't getting the job done, let's take bad and make it worse. You know, like if we're doing something dumb, let's do it more intensely, and that was all the problem. And you know, it's like a shame, you know, like it's really not okay. Um, but that's what we did for those periods of time. And now it's like, it's, you know, but I, I feel like, you know, if we could just sort of say, it may not be perfectly scripted, but if you dive in and figure it out as you go, there's so much more than that, whether what you ultimately produce is great or good or okay or maybe not even that good. I, I think, John, I think you'll, you do a lot of entrepreneurial things here. I mean, kids are learning an enormous amount. Whether what ultimately gets created is anywhere on that spectrum. There's learning in the journey, and, and we need to be more focused on the journey than the ultimate destination. As a head of school, one of the greatest challenges with this is providing adequate education for the teachers, ongoing education. And this is terribly complex. If one is asking someone to be ambiguous, ambiguous, ambiguous. And uh, at the same time, we have these high expectations of them in every other way that match the old system. So trying to do both is really complex. So I see the, the, the challenges in an independent school with flexibility, uh, but in the public school, where uh, I have multiple siblings who are giving their lives to education but doing it in their communities in ways that are, that are far different. My sister who teaches first grade to an unreasonable number of kids um, with a handful of them with learning issues, and she spends most of the time focusing on a couple of kids and not on the large number of kids that need her help and support. You know, the system is so broken. Uh, educating the faculty in this mix is one of the most challenging pieces, for sure. Yeah. And you know, it, it maybe it's what we see what questions the audience has, but I want, because there's a pocket of people I want to talk for a second about public education. And when I wrote my book, when I traveled, I, I didn't have a bias about what schools to visit. And when I picked the examples that blew me away, I picked them because of the examples, because of what I saw in the classroom. And I, I honestly didn't give a lot of thought to what type of school it was. And somebody, somebody when the book came out, so it's, Somebody sent a note to our publisher saying, is this just another one of these books by a well-off white guy about how the only schools that can innovate are charter schools? And I, I said, no, I don't think that's what I, I mean. But I went back and I looked at the, the examples I profiled. And it depends on how you do the math. I mean, if you count like an entire, I write about the entire state of New Hampshire. So that's lots of schools, lots of public schools, but count New Hampshire as one. So we'll count the inspiring examples in this book as one, each one is one. It was like 32 out of 35 are public schools. And it's like, there's this notion that public schools can't innovate. That is not true. They're doing remarkable things under bigger constraints. I, I sometimes think that it can be very hard for a very successful private school. You know, sometimes success makes innovation harder, right? And I think, I did a film on charter schools, so I, I, there are some great charter schools. But what I really go after with the vengeance is when we pit schools of different types against each other and decide that the way we're going to value the quality of the education is with test scores, we have lost all sight, taken our eye off the ball with how do we help all schools be great. And so I didn't know what, you know, as I say, I, I went into that trip not knowing what to expect, but I, I can tell you, and, and most people here are private schools, which is great. I mean, like, we're all fighting like crazy to help kids. But I really am a staunch defender of the, the work being done in our public schools today because it is really, particularly when these teachers are given often very unreasonable marching orders that they know don't make sense. And yet so many kind of courageously step out and do these great things for their kids. And so, so I think they're heroes in our country. I mean, one of the things, and this is an important point, is that our country does have heroes. You know, our, our classroom teachers are unbelievable heroes. And, and we have a country that can respond to aspirational challenges. But I think one of our failings, and, and you know, it goes back. I mean, you know, I often contrast what happened in World War II. I, I, was, I didn't look like it this morning that I was alive during World War II, but I wasn't. 
Um, but my parents were, right? My parents you know, were both part of the war effort. And it, you, it, the history of World War II is so fascinating because it was clear the free world could fall. And you look at the shifts and the sacrifices and the agility of our country to change. I mean, the entire manufacturing base in the United States in 18 months completely changed. And because of that, the free world was saved. I mean, that's not fanciful, that's not hypothesis, that, that happened, right? And, and yet, we had 9-11, and what was our aspirational challenge to America? You know, go shopping, right? I mean, we, if somebody can think of the last time somebody up high actually issued a challenge that we all said, that's important, and we're up for doing our part, tell me about it, because I can't remember one in my lifetime. And, and that's why I get excited about an event like this. That's why I get excited when I visit communities where, where people are coming together and saying, here's a challenge. Let's bring great educational opportunities to all of the kids in our community and have every adult pitch in and do something to help. And, and here's how businesses can help. And here's how policymakers can help. And these are, these are the educators we need to support and trust. And this is the role parents can play. And you start to see this. I write about Pittsburgh, which does this great community-wide celebration. I mean, it stretches all the way down to West Virginia. It's an amazing, amazing challenge to think about what can we do to really reimagine schools, not reform. I, I really think, I, I don't use the word reform because I think we do a lot of like, you know, I call it my book, doing obsolete things better. And, and you know, there's so much of that going on in education. And so much of it, by the way, driven by you know, I sound a bit hypocritical, but a lot of the people, I, if I had the money of Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, I, I have a lot of confidence that we could have, you know, some good impacts here. But, you know, a lot of those people just are all about doing obsolete things better. And, you know, I mean, I visited Chan Zuckerberg twice in the last 18 months. They've got these armies, of, it's like Khan Academy on steroids. You know, we're going to take the, a, an obsolete boring curriculum for kids and port it over to the laptop and let every kid go at their own pace, do something they don't care about. When they ask you if they ever going to use it, the answer is probably not. And when we actually test to see if they retain it, the answer is probably didn't. And somehow that's a major contribution. That's not, a major, that's not what you guys know education is all about. And so, but I do think, not at the national level, in most states not at the state level, but at a community level, there's this incredible opportunity to say, how can we work together? Schools of different types, other people in the community, roles that everybody can play to give our kids a chance to lead the kind of lives they want, the lives that will make their world better, and, and make sure no kid is kind of left out. You know, like no, you know, it's not just the rich kids that can get to the starting line of life. All kids have a fighting chance. We have a starting line that where every kid can line up. I think we can do that. I think we're starting to see that. So I've been really focused more in terms of my time and effort on what can we do in North Dakota and Hawaii, in city, you know, like, you know, I'm in Delaware tonight with a sort of a statewide initiative. But what happens in big, broad communities say, we're going to work together collectively. We're just going to take on this goal of really, really, not slightly tinker around the edges, but give our kids educational opportunities that teachers know. You know, like you, you don't need somebody to tell you how to do it. You need somebody to say, we want you to. You, you've got a permission. You've got a trust. You've got a respect. Do what you enter the profession to do. Engage and inspire your kids in ways that work for that child. If we do that, oh my gosh, I think we're headed for a great time. And back to the optimism and pessimism. I'm very optimistic if that's what we in fact can do. And I worry about whether we go to it. But that's why I come to places like this on, <laughs> sure, I'm, sounds a bit complaining, but I did, I'm not here with a lot of sleep behind me. <laughs> so that, um, but I do this because I feel like when communities come together and say, damn it all, we're going to do, we're going to have the same mind, mindset. Where, you know, I go to a lot of events. I, I frame it this way. I say, I go to a lot of events, not this one, but I go to events, and the vibe there is kind of the same feeling I get when I go to a farmer's market. People are nice and they're polite to each other and they, they say, oh, you're doing that, that's really nice. Uh, you crochet that yourself, that's great. You know, I'll think about doing that. And I say, I want to go to events where the mindset of what it would be if we were in a war room with Dwight D. Eisenhower saying, we don't take these beaches, the free world will fall. 
If we don't have an amazing set of successes that show a region like Eastern Pennsylvania can totally transform education in a period of two, three, four years, if we can't start showing that, there's every chance that the world will fall. But guess what? We are going to show that, right? We're, we're not going to screw around with this. We, we are going to take these beaches. And, and those beaches really are not long shots. You know, like our teachers know what to do. Our kids will respond in ways that blow us away, particularly the kids we call underachieving or at risk. Give them real work they care about. They actually outperform these go fetch it out biscuit kids. You know, we owe it to them to do that. And so I feel like it is the fight of our lives, and I feel like it's an enormous opportunity. But we know it won't happen from Washington, D.C. There is no Dwight Eisenhower on this in our country. It's certainly not Betsy DeVos. You know, if we had done a nationwide search to find the least qualified person for that role, we would have went right to Betsy DeVos. But it wasn't Arnie Duncan. It wasn't John King. It wasn't the No Child Left Behind crowd. If we count on them, if we wait for them, if we think that it's going to be led from somebody like that, it won't happen. It's going to be led by people like this, people that are giving up a day to come here and say, how can we really do the great things for our kids? And build on the inspiring examples. So that's what gets me excited. So let's give those folks a chance to pose some questions. Or I've got a list of great questions, but I'd rather have them come from them. So folks, So I, I'd love to tap in because you've obviously had a lot of experiences going to a lot of different schools. Um, and I'm not sold so much on, hey, we need to have, oh, it's time to go to chemistry, it's time to go to U.S. history and all that. I'm, I'm very interested in students being, getting out of their way. What are you interested in? What do you want to go learn about? How can I help you learn that? But I also think there's, I, I'd love to hear where you see a balance between that and also Sort of the commonality we all need, not necessarily, hey, we all need more photosynthesis or whatever, um, but to become an engaged citizen, to become an informed citizen, there has to be some, hey, we're all doing this so that we get that. And I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, the places I've seen that, that I think are really intentional and thoughtful about it, and I'm going to reinforce what you said. I mean, I totally agree. There are certain things that if, it, if we've glossed over that or it hasn't happened for a kid, We've let that kid down, you know. And I, as harsh a critic as I am of standardized high stakes tests at the middle and high school level, I think they can play a really good role to make sure every kid has learning how to learn skills. If we use them thoughtfully and diagnostically. The places I get excited about, they almost have for each student a visualize this like, almost like a matrix. You know, like along the top are essential competencies. What what do we think every kid should be at least pretty good at? that will matter going forward. I'm a big fan of Ed Leader 21 and it's part of our innovation playlist, but most people will say creative problem solving could be really important, communication, you know, whatever. And it could be very individualized to the kid, could be at a school level, could be at a classroom level, could be, I think the, the more it gets to be a state level, the more it kind of loses it because I think there's real power in having those who own the consequences and race and define the objective, their North Star. But you sort of like visualize those things, like creative problems, communication, whatever. And then I think kind of picking our spots when it comes to content. You know, like, should any kid being educated in the United States have some understanding of the Constitution? I think we'd all agree, particularly today, that understanding the Constitution is important. But AP US History devotes 20 minutes to the US Constitution. When you ask most adults, most adults can't even begin to give you any working definition of the Constitution. So my issue with standardized content is that it's driven by these committees, and every person in the committees commits their little area is essential content. And so you end up with 20 minutes on the Constitution, and two days on the Civil War, and two days on World War II. So it's almost like all kids don't have to cover the things we really know are important, but somewhere in their school life, they should become somewhat of an expert on the Constitution, on certain things, you know, like, would you like kids not to have checked off every box on balancing chemical equations and memorizing the definition of a cell and being able to memorize and play around with the parameters of Coulomb's law, but should we go all out to make sure every kid on the science front comes out of school with two things. One, 
more excited about science than they were when they were in kindergarten. That's actually a big goal, right? I mean, how many kindergarten kids are not excited about science? You, you are hard pressed to find a kindergarten kid in America who doesn't like science. Let's just not screw that up. And second, how do we teach kids to think like scientists? How do we teach kids to think like historians? And so I feel like we did do better justice to saying we can't have everything. We're not, you know, would it be the end of the world if kids don't memorize and drill and drill and drill on factor? I use one of my favorites is factory polynomials, which no one ever does as a scientist or engineer. You know, but I think being thoughtful about that, but, but I'd be all for, I mean, I wouldn't be so on this if every kid coming out of K through 12, when I interview them or when people do surveys or whatever, understood the Constitution. I'd say our standardized curriculum is doing its job if, if we cover the things that really matter. But I don't think we are, and I don't see evidence of that. So I think it's picking your spots and, and seeing what, what would really hold a kid back if they don't know. And then, you know, the other thing that happens, right, I get in this debate with people sometimes about, you know, uh, you know, I think if you read my book, and I do a lot with Tony Wagner, so if you read our books, listen to our talks and everything, we are not in any way, shape, or form saying content's irrelevant. I, I don't believe that, I don't think that, I don't say that. And Tony's, you know, we recently had this online thing where he said it's not, and one of his quotes is, that it no longer matters what you know, it's what you can do with what you know that's gonna define your future. Which people will then say, oh, he's Tony Wagner saying content doesn't matter. That's not at all what Tony believes. But what I say is this, I say, how do you get retained content? And, and then I say, I encourage people to go talk to a fifth, you know, five-year-old, six-year-old who loves something, dinosaurs. And then start to see how much content they've absorbed and retained. These five-year-olds that are deeply curious and fascinated with dinosaurs, I mean, they can spell pterodactyl. They know, they are, they are repositories of deep pools of content because they started with something that, where it was engagement. I think what we do is we have it all, we just do the wrong. We just say year after year, layer after layer of content that some committee thinks down the road might be useful, assuming that it's, because it's covered, it's retained. And I always ask, well, show me the evidence. You know, do you ever retest your kids three months later to see how much they actually remember? I, I challenge the college board, I say to David Coleman, you know, like, all the money you guys get from AP classes seems worthwhile to do a blind pool of kids three months after they took the AP exam and retake it without prep to see how they do. And I bet those scores go from whatever they were, three, four, five to one or two for almost every kid. So, but I think it's a really, you know, it's a really great point. And it's, it is a balance, but I think it's more of a pick your spots and know what really matters and do those really well instead of kind of check off a bunch of boxes. Thank you. Uh, Ted, I'm from a public school. And um, on page 173 in your book, uh -oh. <laughs> you're citing uh, Randy Dorn, uh, the oh, yeah, former Randy superintendent did. in Washington. And, and I love this piece because uh, and being in a public school, you know, we have state standardized tests and we have regulations there and we have to do certain things. Um, and that often becomes an excuse for lots of people, not only in administration, but also in the classroom, to say, well, I can't do that because of this. Jordan says, many public school administrators cite regulations that keep them from innovating. I have the power to grant waivers and will, but I haven't gotten a single request. So I'd like to know more about this issue of waivers, what you might know from other states, and also um, if you know anything about the work of a, a national policy group called Climacall in um, Washington. You know, um, waiver, so I'll give you a good waiver example. So I, I do a lot in North Dakota, and good news, in a very conservative state, you know, arguably the reddest state in the country, quite rural, and in March of 2017, we passed Senate Bill 2186, the Innovation Education Act. Unanimous in the Senate and almost unanimous in the House, any school or district in North Dakota, North Dakota is almost a 100% pure plan of public education. Any school or district that wants a waiver from a bullshit state regulation, a simple form, fill it out, send it in, we're likely to grant it to you. But the, the thing I've done there, I think, if I've added any value, it, it's they pass that. And then, you know, a few districts have done it, but most districts haven't. 
and and the governor, you know, was really like, what, what's going on? You're like, we're doing this, and you're not rushing for it. You know, you're not changing everything else. They said, no, it's not so much they that they're filling in the waiver. It's a message from you in the state legislature that you've got permission. Because I think in many of these places, I mean, the study that Nellie May did, which was so interesting, where they asked a bunch of principals, what are the regulations that absolutely positively keep you from doing what you know would be best for your kids? And they spent a day with them, and they listed all these things that absolutely no nonsense kept them from doing what they wanted to do. And then they had the Nellie May staff actually research them. 70% of what they thought kept them from doing it didn't exist. You know, and it's, but it's easy for me, not being there, to say that, right? And I have a great deal of empathy, particularly when you have these completely offensive, uh, I'm sure it happens in Philadelphia, these, the, the magazine comes out and it ranks your schools and it does it on test scores and AP you know, class coverage and things like that. And I visit schools that are doing remarkable things for kids that rank low on those. And I go to schools that I never want my kid in that rank high on those. But it's easy for me, and it's very hard when you're dealing with the parent community and your school board and everything else. And so I think it's more, it's what I get out with you know, in the book about not telling schools and teachers what they have to do, but putting in place the conditions that let them do the best work. How do we step back and set the conditions so that students are empowered to run forward with stuff that they believe is important to help them develop essential competencies, and teachers feel trusted and respected to do what they are in the profession to do? Um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, it's like once you do that, but, but the model, with, I want to, because this is relevant to public schools, relevant to private relevant, the, the underlying principles of this playlist that, that we're doing, it, it sort of reflects more of a trusted teacher innovation model. And, and our goal and the way it's structured and our advice is not for the head to say in a faculty meeting, starting tomorrow, every teacher has to. Because I think once somebody says everyone has to, no one wants to. And it almost seals the failure of that initiative. So instead we say, here's a really simple, interesting step. You know, example is 15 minutes of curiosity time. But the principal would say, or it could be somebody else in the school. <coughs> Do we have any teachers here that this month would be willing to try 15 minutes of time where students, first on their own and then small groups, can come up with their own thought-provoking questions of what we're studying? If nobody wants to do no worries, but do I have any teachers that would be game for doing that and then tell us what they learned? Well, you, you all know every school has teachers just itching to innovate or even doing that already. So you get six, seven, eight who say, yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. And, and we, we really advise if somebody just dead set will never do it, just try to ask them, don't be the stuck at the garden party. You know, I don't care, you know, if you don't want, if this isn't for you, no worries. If you're teaching traditionally, Maybe you're doing a great job, great. You know, just don't be the skunk at the garden party. Let those six, seven, eight that held up their hand do it. And be willing to listen when they tell you how it worked and get some students in to let them tell you how you do it. And the playlist concept is start with these small things, you know, curiosity time, Socratic seminar based on the topic you came up with, curiosity time, free exploration based on things from that process students want to go deep with. But sort of build it into a sequence so that start with one small thing, get a few teachers. They do more and more of it, starts to spread. Those that are doing it go on to something different that sort of builds on that. They do more and more of it, starts to spread. And you know, honestly, if, if in our schools you can get half the teachers, two thirds of the teachers to be shifting more of the learning to the kids and doing something that's more consistent with, they think, the kind of classrooms we all admire, that's not a small thing, that's an enormous thing. And so I feel like trusting teachers, not telling them they have to, and that's what we do in North Dakota, it's like the, Governor, superintendent of public instruction, the legislators, we do the same thing in Hawaii. Their message to teachers is, we trust you. We're counting on you to lead the way, and tell us how it's gonna go, and we've got your back. And I think when you do that, you start to see a lot of pent-up innovation come forward in all types of schools. Thanks, Ted, for coming today. I, um, I saw your documentary last week, and as I was watching it, I said, someday I would love to see you speak. And I saw you were speaking here next week, and I live uh, in New York City, so I drove up there to see you. Awesome, thanks. Because I do care, similar to you. I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm interested in starting uh, a school, uh, not next year, but the year after. 
And one of the schools that I found, and I just looked quickly, and I saw you mention them in your book, is the Acton Academy in Austin, Texas. And what they have is, I don't know if, everyone, if anyone's familiar, they put the student on the hero's journey uh, from, from the first day, and they don't have teachers, they have guides. And a lot of the original students, or some of the original students, their, their parents ended up starting the, uh, the Acton Academies in other areas, and now they do that for other people. So that's the school I'm interested in starting. My question to you is, I noticed it's only two pages in your book, and to me, that seems like an amazing model that they have. I'm curious why it's only two pages, and if that's a model that you think is worth pursuing um, as I'm looking to, to do that, or is there a lot of other acting academies that I don't know of yet that you can point me to? Yeah, um, so, so let me just share. I mean, I want you guys to visualize my experience there. So I go to this school in Austin, Texas. It's now spread to seven or eight countries and probably 80 schools with a similar model. Um, and I spend like a day there. And for a couple hours, they, they wouldn't let me go in the room because no adult could go in the room. But, but think of two hours, eight, nine, and 10 year olds behind a glass wall doing schoolwork with no adult in the room. I mean, you know, like most of us would say, maybe you guys wouldn't, but I mean, if you talk to a typical audience, they'd say, that's a disaster. Like, these kids are gonna go crazy. You know, like, what could possibly good, what possible good could come out of it? And I'm watching, and these kids are like, so focused. And, and some are off reading a book by themselves, and some are doing something on a laptop, and some are working in small teams, going up to the smart board, and everything else, and they, they said, you can't go in. But we'll let you talk to these kids when they're done. So two hours, two hours. And they start to come out. And what I said before, I'd ask these kids, so I'm just curious, what were you working on? And it was always, I'm curious about this, so I was reading this. Uh, my, some of my classmates, we want to do the science experiments, and we we're trying to figure out it. You know, like they had real reasons. And it's the most radically, in, in, of the schools I visited, student-driven learning experience I've seen. Now, 180 kids, three adult guides, period. That's all. Three adult guides, 180 kids. And the ground rules for the guides are you can never answer a question. You can make suggestions, you can ask other questions, but you can never answer a question. And they said that out of the kids that start, they start at kindergarten, and the kids are the ones who run everything. You know, so the kids are responsible. I saw how they evaluated. Some of the things I wouldn't do exactly the way they do, but that was true with everything. If they did what they wanted to do, and it's so much better to have somebody do what they want really well than what some outsider says might be better for them. Um, but, but for the most part, I'm, I was so excited about it. But the kids run their parent-teacher conferences. They manage and track their own work. They present to their classmates how they're doing and do self-evaluations. And they sit out of every 100% of the kids that start, maybe 15% just doesn't, they need more structure and everything else. I would actually say a kid that needs lots of structure and definition, they're gonna eventually end up in a world that doesn't value that, that wants them to be more self-directed. I, I often quote the senior person from Apple who said, we've decided any employee that needs a boss is no longer employable. So that student agency, which is so important, yet in many places, in most of the education system, you know, preschool, kindergarten kids have lots of agency. By the time they get to high school, more than 100% of their waking hours are pre-programmed every week, instead of letting them have real choice. So back to the question of this. So I was excited and wrote about it. Laura um, wrote a book called, I think it's Courage to Grow, that really goes into detail. But I, and I hope in my two pages or whatever, I got the essentials across, and maybe I, you know, you can read it and decide. But, but I really, one of my goals of the book was to get right at the issue of it's not one model that's going to work. It's, it's what's going on with Acton Academy works for those communities and those people, and that's a creative, interesting thing. But, but there are all these different things. I tried to pick one from every state that really just blew me away. I picked Mid-Pacific, Tom McManus is here. Because what I saw just was like, whoa, this is a great example. But Mid-Pacific is an Acton Academy, and Acton Academy isn't Mid-Pacific. But, but it gets to this core thing about human nature that I think we missed, lost sight of with nationally driven, committee driven, and state driven education policies, which is people do their best work when they have a voice in setting their own goals. 
People do their best work when they organize their own efforts to do it. People will exceed a goal they set for themselves and underperform a goal somebody else shoves down their throat. And that's true for students, and it's true for teachers, and it's true for people in business. It's just true. And so my goal, my goal with the book was to highlight and accentuate and amplify the fact that it isn't one standardized vision of education. But it is something that you can find great proof points everywhere you go. I, I'm sure I could find a school where, where if I visited every classroom and met everybody and checked out every after school program, I wouldn't find something that was really exciting. There must be something. But every place I went, there are some great things. The biggest challenge, I think, is that when you're that one innovative teacher in a school, it gets very lonely. And when every single day you get the message that what you're doing is different and maybe not okay, and when some slight thing goes wrong, it's like, we told you so, we told you so, it's easy to get worn out. If you're that one innovative school in the community that suddenly gets labeled as the alternative school for those kids, it, it's, it's hard to hold your head above water with that. But if you can get 10 teachers in a school to be innovative, very different story. If you get 10 schools in the community to be innovative, they're not in identical ways, but in their way. Totally different dynamic. And so that's what I really think is our path forward, where we're not saying this is the way but this is an interesting way. And, and all I hope with my book is that people say, that's cool. You know, and so I'm sure you want to it before the book, but, but, but some people say, oh, that might be interesting. You know, and we had all sorts of summer discussion books around the book, around what school could be. And in their own way, you know, one of our discussion kind of questions is, what are the things in your school or district you're doing that, that had I visited, I'd write about? What are the things you're really excited about that are kind of breaking from the old mold? Because a lot of times people don't even value what they're doing. They, they, it's kind of on the side, they don't realize it. And then what are the things that you saw in the book that might in your own way inform what you do in the next 12 to 18 to 24 months? And so, so that I, you know, I, I do feel, you know, on the book I, I feel like I, I'm proud of the fact that in, it's not that long a book, and I think it does cover the full landscape of US education, and, and gets at the core issues. But, you know, I, I always say to people, it's not the best book you'll ever read, but it's the best book I'll ever write. <laughs> and I agonize over every word. I mean, I like, I try, you know, like the Acting Academy original thing was probably 10 pages long. I just, I just went, you, you guys write, but I, I, I went through months of this, where I'd write a section, and then I'd say, okay, today, whatever the word count is, 5% of those words are going away. And I just work all day to get 5% of the words out. And then do the next thing. And then, then like three weeks later, I come back to that section. OK, today, another 5% are going. And I just kept doing that and doing that and doing that. And I told my, my publisher, they said, oh, you know, we've got editors. They're going to change the book. A lot of things will be different everything else. And I said, maybe that's true. But you know, the last book I wrote, you know, the scripture told me the same thing. They didn't change a word. So maybe you'll change a lot. I'm open-minded. But I also said, they said, how do you want our changes and suggestions communicated to you? And I said, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to use track changes. You don't have to do anything. I can look at it right away, and I'll know what somebody else is writing. I know what isn't mine. And the reason I say that is, I, you know, I, I did this film. I've done a lot of films. But I did this film that didn't get much play called They Call Us Monsters. I, this, is more, this, this is it's a bit of a uh, this, we're getting fairly far away from back to the county, but I have to tell the story. So Ben Lear did the film, Norman Lear's son. It's about three young adults, one Hispanic, two black, 14-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, working with an English teacher to write the script for a movie. And as you watch this, they call this Monsters Unfold, in many ways they're writing the script of the life they wish they were leaving. Because these kids are in serious juvenile jail. And as the movie unfolds, the 16 and 17 year old get their life sentences. They will be in jail for life. The 14 year old, because they're young enough, leaves. There's a scene that I love, which is the teacher comes into the jail once a week to work with them on the script. And he comes in one week, and they capture this on film. And the three kids are angry. And they're angry because this teacher has changed their script. They said, well, you know, but there's some things I felt it needed some enhancements and some modifications, so I cleaned it up a little. And then Lincoln said, you don't understand. This isn't your script. This is our script. This is our work. You know, 
you can't make changes to our work. And you realize that when you start to take the work of students with its words, but make sure they understand it's theirs, it's not the parent refining the essay, it's not the teacher coaching them to the answer, it's their work. Stand behind it, be proud of it. Accept people's constructive feedback, but it is it's your work, it's so powerful. What I also thought was interesting is you watch this film, you know, it's a, it's a story of America, right? Like these kids are in jail, but you watch them, they're the most engaging, talented, incredible kids. And the thing I begged Ben to do, which I didn't get anywhere on, is to show the audience what kind of school experience they had, because you know they were in school that was buried in worksheets to meet some state-mandated set of requirements, and they just couldn't stand it. And this 14-year-old who gets out, within a month, He's back on the streets, and he will end up serving a life sentence uh, himself because he gets out at age 14, his family structure is disintegrated, so there's no family to go to, he can't stand school, and so he's back with his gang. And it's like, but you see these kids, you realize they, they're incredibly, there's so many incredibly talented kids that are being so poorly served by a, an accountability data-driven worksheet and, and I feel like we got to stand up for that because these kids have such great op, you know, possibilities in life that they're getting a raw deal. So that's a very long answer to a great question. We'll do one more question. Um, it's, it's great that you mentioned that um, movie as, as an example because that sort of uh, follows my question. Do you see um, these methodologies as be? have you seen or do you see going forward these methodologies as being some sort of leveler uh, between schools that you know, have money and schools that are severely underfunded. You know. Can I just say that that is the perfect, if I had to say what's the dream perfect last question, <laughs> you ask it. So, so whatever favor I can do you in the future, I'm good for it. Um, you know, we spent 20, 25 years in America obsessing about the achievement gap in education. It's been the defining focus. And what I observe is that when it comes to the achievement gap, we only have two things wrong. The first is gap, and the second is achievement. And other than that, we've got it right. And so we don't want to talk about it. It's an uncomfortable discussion to talk about the fact that we shower the rich kids with resources, and we deprive the poor kids of resources. We spend the most on those who need the least, and the least on those who need the most. And that's an uncomfortable discussion that we would love to avoid and are very good at avoiding. And, and honestly, you know, like, in the most developed, richest nation on earth, to say that every newborn doesn't deserve a fighting chance in life, I mean, I, like, I hate to hold that mirror up to our country because I think it's, it's unconscionable. But that gap is, gets pushed to the side because then we, we want to say it's an achievement gap and turn it into something that can then make it look like it's the schools and the teachers and the kids' fault, right? It's not society's fault for making some kids go to a school that should be condemned and other kids go to, I had that example in Mississippi, Two public schools 12 miles apart, one should be condemned when you're high school. 12 miles outside in a rich area, it's a school that you know, it's got a football stadium and three, two practice fields and baseball. It's like modern labs, everything, two public schools 12 miles apart. So achievement. So, so, but then we say, to make it worse, we say let's measure the achievement by kids' performance on test scores. The test score content is largely of no interest. So, I share with you what won't surprise you is that in the last four years I've probably been in forums or talked to or interviewed, you know, easily 10,000 kids. How many of those 10,000 kids get up every morning excited about test prep? You no, know, zero, right? Zero. How many are in families with parents excited about their kid doing test prep? Actually, lots. The richer, statistically, the richer the parents, the more educated the parents, the more they are on the test prep game. And so these tests that are, that when a kid looks at it and says it's boring and I don't see why I'll, when I'll ever use it, which by the way, just look at, just look at SAT test prep. And as an adult, ask yourself, if I get good at this, will I ever use it later in life? And the, if you're honest about it, the answer is no. And if you talk to an SAT tutor, they say I spend 100% of my time on gaming the system and 0% of my time on the actual material. So kids don't like it, the parents know it's important, so they're on it. And so what I say is that the achievement as we constitute, as we define it, 
reflects the tenacity of the resources of the parent far more than the intrinsic motivation and talents of the child. And so those poor kids are at a very unfair advantage. We spend the least to help them. Many of them come to school having their last meal the day before lunch at school. We blame it on the teachers. Well, what are you going to do? You know, they're hold you more accountable to these test scores because, of course, it's all your fault. What do I see in the schools I write about? Where kids have a voice in what they're doing, where it's real, where it's connected to the real world? I see two things that are very telling. The rich kids, the kids that have had every friggin' thing done for them by their parents, are the most allergic to that. That They freeze up. It's not clear what I'm going to do to get an A. I might fail. They're the same people I didn't want to back in venture capital. The kids that we call, I think, offensively, misleadingly, unfairly, you know, underachieving or at risk, over and over again, people say, oh my god, I, I didn't know they had it in them. Oh my god, they blew me away. Oh my god, oh my god. I'm so surprised. And I always say, why the hell are you surprised? You're like, this kid actually wanted it. So, so I don't think it'll turn into a feature-length film, but I've been doing some work with a school in the Bronx. And so it's the poorest area of the Bronx, middle school, uh, almost all black kids, tough, tough family circumstances, charismatic principal, starts talking to the kids, what are you interested in? These kids almost uniformly say they're interested in rap music. So, you know, David Coleman, the College Board, the Education Bureaucrat, Michael Bloomberg, everything would say, you're selling these kids' future down the river if you placate them with rap music instead of whatever. Well, what happens, right? You go to that school and these kids can't wait to be there. And these Teachers are trusted to take a love of rap to turn it into an appreciation of language arts, to take beats and to, and to use that as a window into the math behind beats, to take percussion into the physics of percussion. The reason I got heard about the school is that on the, the, the state tests in New York are deeply flawed, as they are in every state, but these kids soar. These kids, without any test prep whatsoever, these kids had the highest growth of any school in the, state, in the New York State, and went from nowhere, from terrible scores, to actually really quite, you know, competing with the best suburbs in New York State. And it was all around the fact that they started with something the kids care about. And it's back to this standardized stuff. It's like when, when it's all done for you by some committee, and when you ask legitimately, am I ever going to use it? And if the answer is no, or probably not, and if it's maybe you will, but you have to relearn it then anyway, it's like, why do we expect kids to fire up and get excited about that? And when you then say to a teacher, good luck, you know, uh, we're going to pay you a lot less, you're in a crappy you know, classroom that's falling apart, you've got an overcrowded set of 35 kids, spring these kids into joyful learning because you're going to teach them how to balance a chemical equation. I, I just say, a teacher that can do that is a waterwalker. I mean, that's an incredible thing. But you, you then say, let these kids have a voice in doing something they think matters, then in a way they can explain and justify makes the world better. Oh my gosh, I just feel like that is our best leveling of the playing field. And then I push back on these bureaucrats and I say, so explain to me again, you know, which is better preparation for life? Memorizing the definition of obstreperous or officious? Factory polynomials wheels quickly under time pressure when no scientist or engineer ever does that? Or inventing and creating an initiative in a way you're proud of makes your world better? Which is better preparation for life? Which does more to level the playing field? Which lets kids find different ways to express their talents and gifts and pursue their interests? And don't tell me that because this is hard to test and measure that we can't do this. And I just feel that's the fight we're fighting, right? Is do we align education with the core humanity of our kids and give every kid a fighting chance in life? Or do we continue to center it on what, you know, a few people feel is a more convenient way to measure their progress on something where at best they hide behind it by saying it builds grit or you know, it's, you know, teaching you how to think or something, which actually none of it has happened. So, so it's a great question, but, but you know, it's like, it's not, it's not a kid here and there. You know, and that's what, back to this issue of the future of democracy, right? is if millions of kids are counting on education to open up life doors, and all they're getting is this drumbeat of you're not capable, you're not smart, you're not that good, when the measure of what you're calling good has nothing to do with adult life and largely reflects the tenacity and resources of the parents, those kids are not being prepared to thrive. 
Those kids are being short, you know, shortchanged every step of the way. And if we have so many of them coming out, can we blame them for being angry or adrift? And, and we see a lot of that in our society. And what happens? How does that play out in a world where machine intelligence isn't tapering off or isn't steady as she goes? I mean, we have this video, The Future of Work, where we just show off. Millions and millions of routine jobs are on their way out. The pressure is enormous to rethink, to reimagine education. And as I see these kids, and I particularly, I mean, I was, I didn't grow up in the poorest circumstances in America, that's for sure. But, you know, my dad was a high school dropout and a carpenter, and my mom was a stay at home. And, you know, so we, we, you know, like, I, I didn't have kind of a lot of advantage. You know, I, you know, I'm not complaining. It was, it was, I'm not in any way, shape, or form comparing what I grew up with with a lot of what kids grow up in America. But at the same time, I fight for kids that grow up in, in challenging circumstances. I fight for those kids because who else will, right? You know, like when you look at a 10-year-old, they, they trust us to make good decisions on their behalf. We know what we should be doing. And, and it's like, God forbid if we just roll over and let state bureaucrats or the college board or whatever tell us what we have to do. And you know, good kudos to you guys for fighting back on parents and saying, no, 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 there is a better way. But the kids I really fight for, the kids that have so much latent great potential, who are dealing with stuff at home that, that if any of us here in this room say we can imagine it, I, I honestly don't. I mean, I hear these stories, I meet some of these kids, and even then, I don't think I can fully, in any way, shape, or form, appreciate their daily struggles at home. Oh my gosh, let's, let's do everything we can during those precious hours of school to give them the best of all fighting chances in life. And we can't, you know, when we see, you know, Jamal Bowman's School of the Bronx, where these kids are suddenly on fire and, and creating great tasks forward, we're doing it. It can be done. And the real question is how do we, how do we sort of move this system from changing slowly to changing quickly? Because that's, that's the fight of our lives. And I think we need to approach it the way we would if, if you were, I, I'll never pass for Dwight D. Eisenhower, but you, know, but you might, you know, but if we were all here, Dwight D. Eisenhower said, no, no kidding, we've got to take these five beaches, and if we don't, the world as we know it, the democracy we cherish, the, the civil society we want our kids to live in, may just not be there. So the fight of our lives, let's fight it, let's win it. inspirational way for us to enter in to uh, these dark months with hope. And my hope is that for the rest of the day, we're all going to get a chance to get to know each other, learn more about what our challenges are, and make some connections in this, as well as have opportunities with another select group of people to stretch ourselves and help all of us be better for being here. So thank you, Ted. And we hand it off to